From the JAMA Network, this is JAMA's Surgery Author Interviews. Conversations with authors exploring the latest clinical research, reviews, and opinions featured in JAMA Surgery. Welcome to our JAMA Surgery listeners. This is Amalia Cochran, the Web and Social Media Editor for JAMA Surgery. Our topic today is oral versus IV and oral antibiotics for uncomplicated acute appendicitis. I'm speaking today with the authors, Dr. Yussi Hyanen. Hi, thank you for the invite. And Paulina Salmanen. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for having us here. They are coming to us today from the University of Turku and Turku University Hospital in Finland. I really appreciate both of you making time to do this. I do think that there is an important background bit of information that we should provide to our listeners, because this is a secondary analysis that we're going to talk more about today. So this was drawn out from the APAC-2, or the Appendicitis Acuta-2 trial. And Dr. Hyannon, I would love it if you could just give us a quick summary of the findings so our listeners can have that framework. Thank you. Yes. As the non-operative treatment for uncomplicated acute appendicitis had been well established in several clinical trials. The initial APAC-2 study was originally designed to optimize the non-operative treatment of uncomplicated acute appendicitis and to assess whether oral antibiotics alone could be a feasible treatment alternative. The APAC-2 was a multicenter non-inferiority RCT conducted in nine Finnish hospitals. We randomized 599 patients with CT-diagnosed uncomplicated appendicitis to treatment with either oral antibiotics alone or to receive two doses of IV ertapenem followed by oral antibiotics. It should be noted that we enrolled a selected patient population as we excluded all patients with an imaging finding of perforation, abscess, appendicolit or a suspicion of a tumor. The endpoint was treatment success, which was defined as discharge from the hospital without appendectomy and no recurrent appendicitis within the first year. At one year, the success rate for the oral antibiotic group was 70.2% and for the IV followed by oral antibiotics, it was 73.8%. Although treatment with oral antibiotics was found effective and safe, we failed to demonstrate non-inferiority regarding treatment success compared to intravenous followed by oral antibiotics. This was the first large RCT comparing oral antibiotics and IV followed by oral antibiotics and showed encouraging results suggesting that oral antibiotics alone could be a feasible treatment alternative and possibly enable future outpatient management. As we have already mentioned in passing, this new study is a secondary analysis from the randomized multicenter APIC-2 trial. Dr. Selman, and why did you think it was important to perform this secondary analysis? Well, I think the results of the one-year follow-up data for multiple trials assessing antibiotics alone are very consistent, but the available long-term outcomes from any RCTs are very limited. We think that having long-term follow-up of these clinically important RCTs is of vital importance, and we have the privilege of having a very nice scientific research setting in Finland that enables the long-term follow-up, and thus we have pre-planned this three-year secondary analysis. And these results are also important for the upcoming and currently already ongoing future trials as the oral antibiotics enable potential outpatient treatment, as Dr. Hayan had just said. And this would be the next step, resulting in further hospital resource and cost savings. And I think the outpatient treatment already was demonstrated nicely by the CODA trial by colleagues Dave Flum and uh, Gianna Davidson, and they're to be congratulated as they already paved the way here by implementing outpatient treatment for approximately half of the patients. So this three-year predefined time point was actually chosen based on the five-year data of the initial APAC trial, showing that the majority of the recurrences occur within the first year and year and a half. So these three results could actually be applicable for a longer-term follow-up also. In that answer, you embedded a lot of things that I inherently had questions about when I started reading through the manuscript. The first of these was 
I thought that it was an interesting design feature that you all used a non-inferiority design to look at treatment success, but a superiority design for all of the other outcome comparisons that were done in your analysis. Why was this choice made? Uh, well, our main interest in this non-inferiority trial was naturally to evaluate the primary outcome and the sample size calculation is based only on the primary outcome. As all of the larger non-inferiority trials are most often underpowered for any other outcome outside the primary outcome, the secondary endpoints do not have their own predefined non-inferiority margins. This is the same approach we already used in the initial APAC trial, and, and this was, of course, predefined in study protocol. As the most important issue, think on the complications, is just to show that there was no difference between the groups. Dr. Selman, and you had mentioned the fact that you all have excellent patient retention, and I certainly noticed that you had a 99.8% rate of patients being available for their three-year follow-up. And as a surgeon in the United States, I would say that's a source of envy for us to see numbers like that. To what do you attribute this retention rate of patients for longer-term follow-up? Thanks for your kind words. And we're also very happy about the high follow-up rate. And this is one of the advantages, as I said previously, in conducting clinical trials in Finland and within a governmental and communal-based healthcare system, as our access to the follow-up data is much easier than, for example, colleagues in the U.S. doing clinical research. So actually, patients and people in Finland don't really move around that much. And as said, we have access to the hospital data from throughout the nation. So the almost perfect follow-up rate, I have to do say that it solely refers to the primary outcome of treatment success, as appendectomies are literally almost always performed within the communal healthcare system. So that allowed the access to the patient records, even if the patient was not reached by phone. And this is very reliable data. But I think it should be noted here that the patients that we actually reached by phone, we still have the longer-term follow-up data that exceeds 80% even for the secondary outcomes. And we're very happy about this because it is everybody that's done uh, clinical trials knows that it really is the major effort and pain to get sufficient follow-up for the patients. So we're very happy for this and very grateful to the Finnish patients and the whole study group and colleagues doing a lot of work on it. So, You also mentioned that the preponderance of patients who required appendectomy, that happened in the first year after study enrollment. And the figure in the article had really stood out to me because you've just got that visual representation of how the arms both flatten after that one-year follow-up. So there was that small residual group in years two and three. And one of the things that I was curious about is if you all have any thoughts about why there is this relatively small but real group of patients who still do require an appendectomy in years two and three. Well, I think I would like to maybe continue on the requirement of appendectomy. I need to point out that in all of our trials, there's a difference between an actual recurrence and then appendectomy rate because our study protocol, as in the initial EPIC trial and also the EPIC-2 trial protocol mandated us to do appendectomy for patients that had suspected clinical recurrence. So the appendectomy rate is actually somewhat higher than the actual recurrence proven by histopathology and the surgical finding. However, most of the appendectomies and recurrences, as you said, they take place during the first 12 to 18 months. And this is very consistent with the initial APAC trial, five-year results. But unfortunately, we don't have the longer-term data on the other RCTs, but the shorter-term results are very consistent with our results. And it seems that the risk of recurrent appendicitis is the greatest during the first year, but after two, three, and at five years, there are only few single cases of recurrence. And I can also confirm this with our actually ongoing, unpublished APAC trial 10-year results, that this also applies between years five and 10. So we're currently working on that secondary analysis. And what is the reason behind this? I would be great for me if I could say that I know the reason, but we really, of course, don't know what's behind it. But I think it's going to be interesting as we have great international collaboration of all RCT PIs for the trials comparing appendectomy versus antibiotics. So we have performed an individual patient data meta-analysis, an IPDMA of all the RCTs, 
and we will be looking into potential prognostic factors for appendicitis recurrence. But of course, at this point, we don't know whether there will be any. But we are also looking at this from a translational research point of view at microbiology and immunology. There is a major knowledge gap here, understanding the pathophysiology of actual appendicitis and the recurrences. So it's going to be interesting to know more. Unfortunately, I can't tell you the reason, but they are two different diseases, the uncomplicated and complicated one. And this seems to kind of apply also for the recurrences, but further research we do need. Well, and it sounds like that's a direction that you all were already working towards as well. Was there a finding that was particularly surprising to you when you began work on the secondary analysis that is in the current publication? Well, I must say that not really, since uh, the, actually the results of, of the three-year secondary analysis were very consistent with the results of multiple other trials when using the same criteria for defining uncomplicated acute appendicitis. But I think defining appendicitis and uncomplicated acute appendicitis is the uh, magic word here, as it has to be noted that our trials, on purpose aiming to rule out complicated acute appendicitis, And the criteria for defining appendicitis severity are still under active discussion and research. In our trials, we are aiming for a very selected patient population of patients with CT-diagnosed uncomplicated disease. From a clinical perspective, we feel that ruling out complicated acute appendicitis is essential when considering non-operative treatment and using all of the known findings associated with complicated appendicitis as exclusion criteria. For example, the presence of an appendicolite. We do realize that by emphasizing this strongly on ruling out complicated appendicitis, we may end up operating on some patients with uncomplicated appendicitis, but this is just fine as appendectomy is also a a valid treatment alternative. From a clinical point of view, we feel that this is a very generalizable approach, ensuring patient safety. My last question for both of you is if the APIC2 findings, particularly anything perhaps from the secondary analysis, have impacted your clinical practice or is it merely reinforced what you were already doing? Well, I think this is a very good question, and uh, I would perhaps like to start off by going back to the COVID-19 pandemic, because that was the first time antibiotics were included in the international guidelines for uncomplicated acute appendicitis as a feasible treatment alternative, and this was actually uh, performed by the American College of Surgeons initially. So at that time, I did get many email questions about the clinical applicability of our APAC2 trial results. And the idea that are you able to use oral antibiotics and outpatient treatment so you don't have to hospitalize a patient. So I think that's one of the issues that the actual APA2 trial had a clinical impact on. But I think it has to be noted that medical reversal is very difficult. So it takes about a median of 17 years for the trial results to be implemented in clinical practice. However, I don't think we're actually quite there yet because the optimization of the non-operative treatment of uncomplicated appendicitis, there are some major knowledge gaps. And we do know that for the surgical approach, laparoscopic appendectomy is already the optimized gold standard. So... The APAC2 trial was the first step to optimize the non-operative treatment, but concurrently with that trial, we actually performed a pilot double-blind RCT APAC number three that compared IV plus PO antibiotics versus placebo, and it showed that perhaps even antibiotics may not be needed, similarly as already shown in uncomplicated diverticulitis. So the major knowledge gap, in our opinion, is actually the role of antibiotics for the treatment of uncomplicated acute appendicitis. And we kind of feel that this needs to be solved before further implementation of non-operative treatment into guidelines, as this is a major issue also regarding antibiotic resistance. So we are both extremely happy. Yusei Hayaden is working as a postdoc researcher in our APAC number four trial that we've been able to initiate the APAC number four just three weeks ago. So that's a double blind multicenter RCT that compares oral moxifloxacin that was used in the APAC two trial and compares that with oral placebo. 
in an outpatient setting, and we will be recruiting 498 patients at nine Finnish hospitals. And hopefully we will be doing this within the next two years. And we already have started, so we're off to a good start. So the primary endpoint will be treatment success, similarly as the previous trials, but the time point will be 30 days. And hopefully after this trial, and I am kind of confident that hopefully we will be able to say whether antibiotics are even needed, which would really change the line of thinking that appendectomy would be needed for all appendicitis patients. And in addition, if the outpatient treatment is feasible, we would really add to the further hospital resource and healthcare savings, not to mention decreased patient morbidity. So I really think that for the 17 years, we still have a few more years to go for the implementation of the secondary analysis results in the guidelines, but hopefully we're working towards that goal. Thank you very much, Dr. Hyannan and Dr. Salmanen for taking the time to speak with me today. Thank you very much. Thank you. This episode was produced by Shelley Steffens at the JAMA Network. To follow this and other JAMA Network podcasts, please visit us online at jamanetworkaudio.com. Thanks for listening.